And good day, everybody. My name is Mathieu of Red Hat Research, and I would like to welcome you to another Research Days event. Today, we will hear about software profiling, which brings me to introducing our main speaker, a PhD student at Brno University of Technology, Iri Pavela. He will be aided by a senior Red Hat software engineer, uh, Victor Malik, who has taken the role of conversation lead. With this, uh, I leave the floor to you, gentlemen, and welcome. Okay. Hello, everyone. I uh, hope you can see us and hear as well. Um, so yeah, it's my great pleasure to welcome Miri here, who is a colleague of mine from my PhD study, and who'll tell us something about his research on efficient profiling. Um, so a few organizational things. Um, if you have any questions during the talk, uh, please feel free to write them into the chat or to the Q&A section. Um, the talk itself will be for some 45 minutes, roughly. Uh, Yirka has it divided into several large parts. So after each of these parts, we will make a short break and we can answer some uh, most relevant questions for that part. And in the end, we will have another 45 minutes uh, to have a longer discussion and, and question section. So if your question is not uh, answered during the breaks, uh, during the talk, uh, don't worry, it will be, it should be answered uh, afterwards. Also, uh, in uh, feel free to jump into the session and ask your question live. We recommend it, but you're not forced to do it. If, if you don't feel like it, uh, just uh, write to the chat and I will repeat it and, and you can answer it. Okay, I guess that's, that's pretty much from the uh, introduction and Yuri, the stage is yours. Uh, okay, thank you very much for the nice introduction, Victor. Um, so in this talk, uh, I would like to present to you the one of my research area that I focus on uh, in my PhD study, uh, and that is uh, efficient profiling. And most notably, I would like to focus on the challenges that we are facing in the area of efficient profiling and the solutions that we came up with or refined uh, some existing solutions so that they're more efficient. Uh, of course, uh, a lot of the things I will talk about is still very much a work in progress. Uh, we have a lot of future work to do, but I think it's uh, the things I will talk about. This is a really nice uh, beginning uh, or an entry level to efficient profiling. So with that said, uh, first, let please allow me to maybe share with you a motivation. And that is, why should you care about performance? Why should we perhaps all care about software performance? So I've prepared some examples to show you that software performance bugs are an omnipresent problem. Uh, so for example, if you're developing a cluster computing engine, uh, after an update, you might uh, see that uh, you've introduced a performance bug that will effectively halt your computation uh, when you supply a large job batch, which is something that actually happened. Uh, another, I'd say maybe even horror story, uh, is a famous Stack Overflow uh, outage, which was actually caused by a performance problem in one of the uh, regex matching algorithms, uh, which basically caused a half an hour outage. And I think you can all imagine the amount of lost money uh, that happened during that half an hour. Uh, or if you're developing parsers, there's uh, a lot of, mm, let's say, room for making some uh, performance mistakes that will result in your parser parsing much slower than it should. So you might think that, uh, well, this can't really happen to me. I'm not working uh, on such large scale projects or I have a small team. We're just developing a small tool those issues don't really uh, affect us. Well, I'd say that it affects you too. So some more examples. Uh, if you're developing a compiler and you use an inefficient algorithm, uh, you might run out of memory, which happened for a C-sharp uh, compiler uh, because the way they implemented constant folding of strings. Or in uh, the Elasticsearch software, uh, one of their routines basically uh, resulted in half of the CPU time 
being spent in one simple or not simple, but in one uh, procedure. Uh, let's say you're using a Vim editor. Uh, if you use inefficient structures, you can end up with a uh, quadratic complexity in the number of, uh, let's say, some elements uh, that you're trying to process. Uh, or if you're writing a parser for uh, generating documentation, uh, you might end up with a quadratic complexity loop uh, in your parser just by making some small mistakes. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that performance bugs are actually everywhere, most likely in your code too. They might, as of now, you might not even know there are there. Uh, they might have not manifested yet. They might be just waiting for the right input uh, that someone will provide them or the right size of the input that someone will try or tool on. So what can you actually do as a developer to find those bugs and maybe even detect them before uh, they cause some catastrophic failure? So there are multiple uh, approaches to finding performance bugs. I, I listed just, I'd say, some of them and made some rough generalization to give you an idea of what they are, how they work. So if you're a bit familiar with some static analysis approaches, you might have heard uh, about worst case resource bounds analysis and tools that perform those analyze, uh, analysis. Uh, so the nice thing about them is that since they're rooted in formal methods, they are able to give you some formal guarantees in some cases. Uh, with these tools, we can talk about stuff like soundness and completeness, which are really nice properties to have in your analysis tools. And if you happen to be analyzing some safety critical software, those tools or those approaches might be the only viable option for you to prove some uh, resource bounds. Not always, but it often is so. Uh, the downside is that those tools and approaches, they require uh, or their, mm, their entry level barrier is much higher than with a lot of other tools. So you are expected to have some background in formal methods uh, to understand how the tools work. Those tools also usually don't scale that well. If you have large software, uh, you might not be able to analyze it. And what also happens is that for some fragments of your code or for some parts of your code, the analysis might fail or it might be a bit too pessimistic, which happens quite often, I'd say. Okay, so what are the other approaches? Uh, there are tools that perform some anti-patterns detection and log analysis. Those tools are usually on the border of static and dynamic analysis. Uh, I've seen tools that incorporate both of those techniques. So uh, they are usually a bit easier to adopt, to learn how to use those tools. They scale a bit better than the uh, formal methods, I'd say, or the, the tools rooted in formal methods. They sometimes can give you some formal guarantees, but it's not really that common. And their analysis is on quite high level and the results are quite coarse. So it's difficult to find the actual root cause of the issue. You just know that there is an issue. You might know that there's some anti-pattern, but it's hard to figure where exactly or what exactly went wrong. Uh, then we have performance testing and benchmarking. Uh, I'd say those are probably the most well-established tools uh, to do uh, some performance analysis. Uh, so those tools are easy to adopt. They usually have some good or pretty good uh, CI and that, that is continuous integration and continuous delivery support. Uh, and they scale reasonably well, I'd say. Uh, yet there are no formal guarantees. So if your if, if the benchmarking you're using is uh, saying that your tool is behaving uh, pretty good performance wise, that doesn't give you a guarantee that it will work uh, fast when a user submits an input you weren't really expecting. Uh, the analysis is still a bit coarse. So you usually, let's say, if we're talking about benchmarking, you'll get one, two, three numbers that tell you uh, what uh, what is the current performance. But if you find out that the current performance is much 
worse than uh, in the previous version, you don't really know where to look at. You might know uh, what functionality was the benchmark, the, the specific benchmark testing, but you don't really know much more than that. Uh, and of course, there's the issue of garbage in, garbage out. If you create uh, bad benchmarks, you will get bad results. That is results that won't really help you um, in tackling any performance issue. So uh, with that said, let's get to profiling. Uh, I'd say uh, that it's, again, as with the performance testing and benchmarking, it's quite well-established approach um, that's been here for some decades already. Uh, the good thing is that you get pretty good data granularity. That is, uh, you get uh, quite detailed data that are really good for finding the root causes of your performance issues. So you get detailed data. It's easier to uh, find where that particular issue is. Uh, the downsides, however, are that you still don't have any formal guarantees. Right, as with the performance testing and benchmarking, that's just an inherent downside of dynamic analysis techniques. Uh, so next, we have insufficient continuous integration support, which is actually something we might be able to uh, work around or we might be able to tackle um, compared to the formal guarantees. And one pretty big downside is the significant overhead that people tend to associate with profiling. Uh, I'm pretty sure that if you ever heard of profiling, you also heard uh, that a lot of the tools that perform or that allow you to profile uh, your application tend to cause, let's say, 20 times overhead. That, that means your application will run 20 times slower than if you run it just as it is. So this is something that people usually tend to associate with profiling. And again, we believe that this is something that can be partially solved. Uh, so as I said, the issue with profiling is overhead. And that is we have high granularity data, which is really good because we get to identify the performance bugs uh, or the root causes of the performance bugs at the cost of time and possibly even memory. So the natural question would be, um, can we have the cake and eat it too? That is, uh, can we achieve high granularity that will help us to find the root causes of issues without the time and memory overhead of profiling? So we actually believe it is possible somewhat, uh, not with the cake. I don't think anyone ever solved that yet. But with uh, the profiling, the idea might be to limit the high granularity to you know, where it actually matters. That is, uh, parts of your code, parts of your code or, or your project that don't really, um, that aren't really that important performance wise, don't need a high granularity. But some places where the uh, performance bug is much more likely to occur really need the higher granularity to be able to identify the bug quickly if it happens. Uh, the second issue with profiling is something we call recency. Uh, so the general idea is that it pays off to discover uh, bugs quickly, not just performance bugs, but bugs in general. Uh, there has been a study that actually tried to uh, evaluate some or get some uh, exact numbers. And in their study, they found out that uh, recently uh, introduced bugs uh, compared to the dormant bugs, that, that is bugs that are in your code base for, let's say, months or even years. So the recently introduced bugs, they take less time to fix. Uh, the difference is around three days. Uh, those bugs can be fixed by less experienced developers, which, again, saves money and time. And the fix is generally smaller. Uh, from the results they obtained in their study, it seems that there is uh, the, the fix. The fixes are half the size uh, compared to the dormant bugs fixes. So the takeaway is that new bugs or newly introduced bugs should be discovered as soon as possible. Um, I think that if you ever did some testing, not uh, necessarily performance testing, uh, you've already noticed the, um, I'd say, industry uh, standard 
of uh, doing a CI testing that is continuous integration testing, uh, automated testing that tests every new release and so on. So it's pretty common in the area of uh, functional testing. But what about profilers and performance in general? So profiling is typically done only late in the project development, uh, usually when your application is mostly ready. Uh, so you have all the features, all the functionality you want, and then you find out that the application is running real slow. So this is when you usually deploy uh, or use uh, some profiling tools. And those tools generally, um, ignore the project and profiling history. So when you profile your application, there is no context, uh, whether this is a new release or whether you've already done some uh, profiling in the past and discovered some issues or not. Uh, yet we think that the past profiles, especially when coupled with version history of your tool are really valuable. Uh, and the idea is to develop and design some incremental profiling techniques uh, we'll get to that later. Uh, so, can we? So, I, I talked about those two issues and how we believe that they could be fixed. Um, so, we've actually developed a tool that is trying to tackle all those issues. Uh, we call that tool Perun, and uh, the description would be it's a performance version system. So, we like to call Perun a complex solution for performance analysis and testing. Uh, so what does it actually mean? It means that Perun can collect performance data. Uh, it can create performance models out of those performance data. Let's say, for example, you can employ some regression analysis to obtain some easier mathematical representation of your uh, performance. It also integrates version control systems, which is uh, uh, a key change, I would say. So the tool gets access uh, to the entire project history uh, and it is able to detect performance changes such as various degradations and optimizations across those versions. Uh, and lastly, it also visualizes the performance results. So just to compare maybe with the traditional profilers you might be familiar with, uh, they often do or perform just the uh, the collection part that is they, they collect the performance data uh, sometimes those tools also offer some visualization but uh, most of the other um, let's say or, or those tools don't usually support some performance models or vcs integration and so on so this is uh, the special thing about perun i would say why we call it a complex solution so uh, just a quick overview of how it works. Uh, so there are four major steps in, in the Perun workflow. Uh, the steps are called repository, profiles, models, and detection. And uh, I will just briefly so talk about each of those steps to better understand uh, how Perun works and what it actually does under the hood, which will be important later. So the first step is a repository. That means you have your uh, working directory where your project lives. Um, and in this uh, working directory, you usually use some version control system that helps you track version history, uh, switch different uh, feature and development branches and so on. And in this version working directory, you can also initialize Perun alongside the version control system, which actually allows uh, or um, allows you to integrate the, to the two tools. Uh, so the second step is profiles. That means that whenever you decide you want uh, to create or, or to measure your performance, you can obtain some performance profiles. And those profiles will be stored within Perun and linked to the corresponding uh, version of your project. That means that if you are working on a new release, and you want to check if your performance or if the performance of your new code is good, uh, you can basically profile your application, you obtain a profile and the profile is directly linked to that version. So you can access it later and see uh, in the history how that particular version of your software was performing. Uh, so this is really the key part of the uh, version control system linking between profiles and versions. Uh, the next step is models. So uh, 
from those data we obtain, we create some performance models that help us to represent the data a bit uh, more compactly, I'd say. Uh, so the models are stored uh, alongside the profiles uh, and they're linked to the profiles. And by that, uh, they are also linked to the project version. So when I talk about models, it might sound a bit too abstract. So uh, what to really, what, what should we really uh, think? Like, what is the example of models that we could think of when, when talking about models? So I'll give you one example, uh, which is uh, the regression analysis. So models in Perun are in general, some mathematical functions of the input size or some statistical summaries that describe the main features of the profile. In the case of regression analysis, that means we have some mathematical representation of a uh, function results. And if you look at this image, you'll see that you have some, uh, some performance data which are represented by the red dots. And you have some models that try to um, capture the, the main feature of those data. And if you uh, provide a mechanism to select the best model, you can actually get uh, that the, the data are be, or the performance is behaving linearly. That doesn't mean the function is necessarily uh, or necessarily has a uh, linear complexity. We don't really know, but it's just behaving linearly uh, given the input we gave it. So when I talk about models, you can uh, imagine uh, some mathematical curves or some mathematical equations that uh, help you represent some uh, large or possibly a large batch of data. Uh, and the last step is detection. So when we get our um, performance profiles and possibly even models, that is optional, we might or we might not, uh, you can try to detect, or if, if you get those uh, performance data and models for different versions of your software, you can then employ some uh, checking algorithms that will detect if there happened some performance degradation or some uh, possibly optimization within your code. Uh, so to do that, we uh, tend to speak about target and baseline models or profiles. Uh, the target is usually the current version or the version you're working with. Uh, and the baseline is some, let's say, previous version of your, um, of your application. Let's say that uh, the baseline could be the previous uh, release version of your tool and the target is the new alpha version in which you implemented several features and now want to check if, if some performance degradation perhaps happened. So again, some quick example. Uh, there is actually quite a lot of detection algorithms within Perun uh, and I'll talk about exclusive time outliers, which uh, I'll reference later also. So, um, some of our um, collectors or tools that actually gather the performance data, they are collecting uh, the actual time spent within a function or within all functions uh, in your code. So when you measure time uh, that basically elapsed when the function was um, executed, you have two options. You can either, uh, com let's say, mm, measure the, the time it took from the start of the function until the return of the function, uh, including all of the called uh, helper functions uh, where there can be hundreds of them. Or you can measure only the exclusive time, that is the time that was actually spent doing only the code within that function without any call, called functions or library functions and so on. So uh, if we're talking about exclusive time outliers, it means we're working with the exclusive time, that is time spent only in that function. And we're actually checking the, the deltas, that the differences between the exclusive time in one version uh, and the other. Uh, so the algorithm employs uh, several uh, statistical techniques to uh, detect outliers and based on which technique uh, detects uh, the change, uh, we define or we uh, decide the severity of that change. So the, techniques, the technique works uh, rel in, in relative terms. So uh, from all the changes happened, we all, the algorithm always selects a few that are the most severe uh, and the rest which are less severe and so on. So it's, it's in relative terms. Uh, okay, so 
uh, before going to a demonstration of Perun and how it can actually help you, uh, I'd maybe uh, make a quick break and see if there are any questions you might have, any uh, ideas or any input, something you would like to ask about. So we currently don't have anything in the chat. Okay. Um, so I think uh, you can keep going uh, to the next section and yeah, there will be more questions uh, afterwards, probably. Okay, uh, I see two questions already. Uh, ah, okay, yeah. So we can maybe try to address them. So the first one uh, from Thomas is, is it possible to run this in a distributed manner? Um, as of now, not really. Uh, right now, it's basically serving as a tool for our experiments, for our um, ideas that we like to implement and test. But uh, definitely, I think the, the ideas we employ in Perun are not um, uh, restricted to your local machine only. So it would be possible to make it distributed. As of right now, we don't really have the manpower or uh, the time to implement it. Uh, as I said, it, it mostly serves as uh, an experimental tool for us to test new things and our ideas and so on. Um, Okay, and the second question uh, is that it's not clear if this is benchmarking or code profiling or both. Um, so I'd say that both is the correct answer. So um, the architecture of Perun is uh, modular in the sense that you can integrate various tools and various uh, techniques within it. So you can, for example, integrate some of your favorite profiling tools and then you're able to profile the code or you can also in, integrate some of your favorite benchmarking tools and then you can benchmark and for different types of results and data you obtain you can employ different uh, detection techniques and modeling techniques so it's not really restricted only uh, to profiling in, in the broader sense okay yeah, thanks we have a uh, michael Kleisen in the room so uh do you want to ask a question michael Okay, so Michael just left. Uh, so we can proceed to the following questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so the next question is, uh, how heavy is the output of Git hash to performance data for Perun? Uh, so as of right now, I'd say it's quite a heavyweight. Um, I'll get to that particular issue a bit more later. Uh, so, so the issue is basically in how uh, granular you want to have your data. Uh, most of the tools we are, or most of the profiling tools we work with and that we test our ideas on are quite granular or allow uh, quite granular results. So uh, for that reason, the, the data are, or, or the profiles are generally quite large. The linking itself is pretty cheap, actually. Uh, we employ a similar uh, architecture as in Git. So, so Perun is, I'd say, heavily git inspired so it's basically stored in your local file system in uh, in some directory structure very similar to git uh, but the profiles themselves depends on the tool you use but for the tools i will be talking most mostly about uh, it's quite heavyweight i'd say as of right now uh, if that answers your question okay uh, so there's next question. Um, uh, does it work with a runtime backend kind of application as for example, uh, JVM? Uh, again, that is uh, really dependent on the tool you use. So uh, the results or, or, or the data I will be showing in the next demonstration or the next next section, uh, they will be uh, those will be data obtained from one of our tracing tools. Uh, which is employing system tab. Uh, so uh, not really a virtual machine, uh, but we also have some uh, profiling tools built uh, on BPF or eBPF, which are quite similar, I'd say. Um, th there's, there's some virtual machine running in the kernel which collects data for us. Uh, so it's, it's, um, it's tool specific, I'd say. It really depends on the tool uh, you use for the actual profiling. 
if if that answers the question. Yeah, okay, well, let's go to the next, mm -hmm. next one. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. if, if you can see it. Yeah, yeah. So there's the questions. Uh, the, the question if uh, the models are user defined, if you can create specific model to use with multiple inputs instead of relying on a linear regression. Uh, yes. Uh, so as, as I was uh, talking about the possibility to uh, integrate uh, different profiling tools, you can also integrate your custom uh, models. So you basically just create some uh, Python functions that you register as a new uh, modeling um, representation or model representation, and then you are free to use it on the data you collect, uh, which preferably should, uh, or let's say, uh, we don't really expect the, the models to be applicable to all types of data. So you can restrict uh, which kinds of profiles you want to be able to model and which you don't really support because the models don't, don't make really, don't really make sense on that type of data. So so yes, you can. Okay, uh, the next question is which languages do you work with? Uh, as of right now, uh, we are mainly focused on C and C++, but uh, as of quite recently, uh, we've also integrated some profiling tools for C Sharp and we have a um, work in progress tool or profiling tool for uh, Java. So we're not really restricted to a one specific language. Uh, it basically only depends on the manpower we have and, and, uh, and whether someone gets the time to create a new tool or integrate new tool for new languages. So we're not, we're, the, the tool itself, the Perun is tool uh, or language agnostic. So it's not really restricted. There's a follow-up question if the mm -hmm. C and C++ uh, require some special compilation uh, so that they can be used with Perun. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so um, as of right now, uh, not really. So if you use our uh, tracing tools, which are uh, built on uh, system tab or eBPF, you don't really need to recompile uh, the, the, the source code. Uh, the downside is that you will usually uh, get a bit higher overhead with this type of uh, tracing than if you would just do a very lightweight instrumentation in your code or in the um, object code and then just uh, execute it quite quite fast. So you don't need to. It's usually faster. We actually have in works um, a new instrumentation engine uh, or, or a new instrumentation uh, tool that works on top of LLVM. So you'll be able to uh, compile, do basically compile time instrumentation, which should be a bit faster. So you don't really need to uh, recompile, but you can for some performance benefits. Okay, thanks. I think that that's all for, for questions now. There was a question about Rust. I think you don't do you mention it? Uh, I'll mention it uh, at the end of the presentation, actually. Um, so if if you feel like, feel free to uh, uh, stay here until the end when I'll mention Rust. There was also a, a follow up question we we missed uh, from Francesco. Uh, he says he was more concerned of the bimodal nature of performance data coming out from JVM applications. Um, to be fair, I'm not really that familiar with JVM. I know that uh, we have some people that are more familiar with, with uh, Java and their virtual machines in our research group, uh, but I'm frankly not one of them. So I might not really be sure what you mean. Um, perhaps we can uh, touch on that a bit later or uh, in, the, uh, in the last discussion, uh, the, the last section of the discussion where we can maybe devote uh, more time to that. If, if that's okay. Uh, but just as a disclaimer, I'm not really that familiar with, with Java. So yeah, I'll need some more, uh, more clarification on that perhaps. Okay, uh, so should I get back to the presentation perhaps? I think so, yeah. I think it's, thank you for everyone for the questions and uh, let's go on with the, with the yes. second part. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you also for the questions. Were really, really uh, nice questions, I'd say, um, uh, to the topic, I would say. So in the next section, I would like to maybe show you some quick demonstration of, of how Perron actually works and how it can aid you in, um, in finding performance bugs or changes. So some of you might know the C Python tool or, or project, which is basically a reference C implementation of a Python interpreter. Uh, so quite recently, uh, there has been an issue reported. Uh, that issue stated that there um, is a performance regression in one of Python's modules. Uh, and the regression consisted of um, around 8% 8 8 higher function call overhead in a new alpha version of Python 3.11 uh, as compared to a, uh, by that time, stable release of Python 3.10. Uh, just as a disclaimer that bug wasn't detected by us or our tool, uh, we just noticed the bug and we wanted to see if we were able to replicate it in perhaps a more automated manner, uh, at least for the detection itself and, and finding the root cause of the issue. So that issue can be replicated using one of the benchmarks that was provided uh, for the C types. And it was fixed quite soon after the report. You'll see uh, shortly that the fix was uh, not that difficult. So that's perhaps why it was fixed uh, quite fast. So you might think um, problem solved, issue found, issue fixed. Why would we need any tool? So uh, the main cost or the main um, chunk of time that you spend when uh, fixing such issue is finding the actual root cause. This is the hard part. So it often takes a lot of time for the developers or testers. And when you use Perun, uh, Perun is basically trying to reduce this effort and um, help the developers by saving some time. Um, Perun does it by utilizing the recency principle and results from past profiling. So if you recall when I talked about recency and the thing that you usually profile late in the application development, uh, this is, this is recency and past profiling where, where it can bring you some benefits if you do profiling regularly. So uh, if we would use Perun, we could handle the issue as follows. Um, let's assume we initialize uh, the C Python repository with Perun. So we have a version control system and Perun performance version system alongside each other. Uh, let's say that for the release version 3. Point dot, uh, or 3.10.4, uh, you already profiled uh, the C types benchmark. So you did run a benchmark and also you did uh, collect some performance data, perhaps while running the benchmark or uh, as a standalone uh, input. So you obtain a profile. The profile is linked to that particular version. Uh, we will call that profile as baseline in the following slides. And just as a quick reminder, the profile commit link is handled internally by Perun. Right, so you have some previous profiling results which are stored and linked to the particular version they were performed on or collected on. Uh, let's say the new alpha version uh, of 3.11 uh, Python rolls out and you want to see if perhaps this version introduces some performance regressions. So again, you profile that particular benchmark uh, either standalone or during the benchmarking process uh, for the particular version. Uh, I also include some simplifications of the commands you would use. Uh, in, uh, in reality, the commands might be a bit uh, complicated or let's say more complex. It really depends on the use case. And we denote the resulting profile as a target. Uh, and now we can use our checking um, techniques or methods to compare the baseline and target profiles. So as I said, we support multiple compression algorithms. And for this particular issue, we try the exclusive time outliers. So we can safely say a regression is definitely detected. So there's a uh, total degradation reported around 9%, uh, which is quite close to the 8% reported in that, um, in that uh, GitHub issue. So we know there's a degradation. Uh, what more, we also know in which functions the degradation happened. So if you look at it, there are two functions. Uh, one of those uh, we classify as not in baseline. 
uh, the, or the issue, the change, we classify as not in baseline, which means that this function was not in the baseline profile, yet when introduced in the new version, it, uh, it created or it, it contributed to the total runtime of the particular input by 5% which is quite a lot, right? You introduce a new new function in your code and it instantly consumes 5% of your runtime. That's quite a lot. And then we identify a function that has been in the previous version in the baseline and compared to the baseline version, uh, we detected a severe degradation. That is uh, some severe uh, runtime uh, change. So as I uh, said before, the, the exclusive time outliers method works relatively. So the, the severity of the degradations or optimizations are relative to each other. So that's why you might think 3.5% change, that's not really severe. It is if you compare it to the other results as you see 0.19%. Uh, okay, so root cause of the issue was repeated cause of the initialized, uh, the C types in it field description function. So I've in, included a snippet of the code. You can see that there's some um, condition which is checking if uh, initialization happened. If not, we initialize. But there is no um, there is no code that sets the initialized to true. So whenever we call the C types get field descriptor, we always initialize again. So. Uh, this basically, this is something you are able to uh, identify when you look at the code and you know that those, those two functions actually contribute to the change the most. So now that we know where the problem is, we can create a hotfix and we can hope that this, our, this hotfix of ours will fix the issue, right? So we add new code and if we're, um, uh, if we're not sure if that fix actually works, we should perhaps profile the new hotfixed version. So again, we collect a new uh, new performance data. Uh, we denote the resulting profile as hotfix. So you can basically create it uh, as some form of tag. And now we should compare the baseline and the hotfix profiles to see if this fix actually worked. So it's safe to say that the fix worked. Uh, if you look at the results, there are uh, two by two columns. So you have um, the time delta uh, as compared or in the hotfix version and in the previous uh, target version. So the, the green columns represent the new hotfix version and the red columns uh, represent the old uh, alpha version without the hotfix. So as you can see, the total degradation is now only 1.7%. It's still something you might, it might be worth looking into. So uh, I've included only a small uh, part of the total results, but the important thing for us is that the two functions that caused the most uh, re or, or that uh, were regressing the most uh, now seem to be fixed, right? The change is 0% or 0.06%, which is um, pretty much nothing. So it's safe to say that uh, our hotfix worked. So you can see that Perun leverages version control system that profile uh, version linking and recency, that is profiling as soon as you release a new version to successfully discover and help you locate performance issues in new project versions, right? So if you profile, uh, uh, let's say every time you release a new version, and you have somewhere stored uh, the profiles of your previous profiling results uh, or your pro previous profiling, you are able to actually not only detect that there is an issue, which is something that benchmarking might be able to do too and much cheaper. You can also instantly uh, see where that issue is. So you don't have to uh, wait for benchmarking to uh, happen and to tell you that there's, let's say 5% change, which is something you also sometimes need to do by hand. That is, uh, you, you, you need to store the benchmarking results somewhere manually and then look at the results and compare the results and see if there's a difference. When you uh, store it within a tool and the tool handles the linking and the tool handles the automated detection, you can see the results pretty much automatically uh, without much manual work. So uh, I'd say, Let's talk about the efficiency problem. 
So I've demonstrated demonstrated a uh, how bug hunting works in Perun. And my question now is, was that efficient? Was it really that efficient? Wouldn't benchmarking perhaps be a bit better? So to be fair, it wasn't particularly efficient. It took us, uh, or the tool we used, it, it took us around 30 minutes to obtain all three profiles and check if there's some uh, some difference, which might not be that much, but if you profile uh, frequently and for a lot of new releases, it definitely is a lot of time. So. The question is, can we do better? Can we achieve better efficiency? So uh, the first idea you might have is, well, we should perhaps reduce the granularity, uh, collect just some uh, more uh, high level data that will help us determine if a performance change happened. Uh, in that case, we risk that we'll end up with a benchmarking, both in terms of efficiency and precision. So we'll detect a performance change, but we, we won't really know much more than that. So what are our other options? We can optimize the instrumentation. That's usually the first, first thing that people think about. Okay, so our tool is a bit too heavyweight. We could perhaps use uh, more lightweight instrumentation. We could perhaps use uh, a compile time instrumentation instead of dynamic instrumentation and so on. So, my problem with this approach is uh, it's typically tailored only for a specific language or environment. That is, uh, you are able to optimize instrumentation for C, C++ programs, but if you'll introduce new profiling tool that uh, profiles J Java programs, you won't really get that benefit. So it's, it's the equivalent of um, optimizing your code for specific architecture, right? It's not really portable, it's not really general. So that won't work too. Uh, our idea is to come up or to, to invent a general profiling optimization techniques. That is techniques that should be applicable to large variety of profiling tools, uh, tools that work on different granularity level, that work on different um, languages and so on. So truly general uh, profiling techniques. Um, the ideas behind those techniques is those that I've already mentioned. That is uh, limiting high granularity only to places where it actually matters. And the idea of incremental profiling. Um, I should maybe say that the incremental profiling uh, thing is um, inspired by some recent advancements in the area of static analysis, uh, most notably uh, meta infer, which, um, uh, which basically does some incremental static analysis uh, that helped uh, to achieve pretty reasonable scaling, at least for static analysis tools. Okay, so what are the core concepts of efficient profiling that we uh, observed or that we came up with? So the main, uh, the, the, the core concept one is that only a subset of all profiled functions are responsible for, uh, or, or not only, but a subset of profile functions is responsible for a sizable or even significant portion of the overhead while producing uninteresting performance models. Um, so uh, that might sound a bit too general. So what should you think about when, when I talk about this observation? That means, uh, let's assume you have a code that utilizes or that calls a particular constant uh, complexity function a lot of times. And I mean a lot of times, like hundreds of millions of times. Uh, if you profile, if you instrument all of the function calls or all of the basic blocks, uh, you'll end up with a ton of overhead because um, you will be executing the same instrumentation code or both instrumented and instrumentation code a lot of times. Um, and frankly, that data won't really give you much insight. Right, um, you will see that this particular function perhaps consume 10% of your entire runtime, but it will, will be at the cost of a lot of time overhead. While perhaps if you would go up the call stack and you would profile a function that is calling or that calls this particular constant function, you might, or, or maybe quadratic function, um, you might save up on a lot of overhead. So you will see, let's say 10 calls to that particular function, which is calling uh, this constant function millions of times, and you will get 
perhaps a, a bit, little bit less precise results, but at the cost of a saved overhead, a, a lot of overhead. Uh, so this is the main idea. Focus on functions or code blocks, basic blocks uh, that are valuable from the performance modeling or performance data standpoint, um, while perhaps producing um, less overhead. Uh, I also mentioned functions with constant like runtime behaviors. So what I mean by this is uh, that sometimes um, static analysis tools might give you a hint or, or uh, the insight into function complexity, uh, which states perhaps this function is in worst case quadratic complexity uh, given the input, uh, which might be true. Your function might truly uh, behave in a quadratic worst case manner, but given the actual inputs you're using and you're expecting to be used, that function might be only linear, right? Uh, so perhaps we shouldn't only focus on the complexity itself, but also on the actual runtime behavior of those functions. As I said also earlier, static tools sometimes produce a bit too much pessim or a bit too pessimistic um, estimations or, or results. So the key takeaway is uh, we don't really need to profile those functions that generate a lot of overhead while giving us a little performance insight. But perhaps we should focus on functions that are higher in the call stack. Uh, the second observation is that even functions that are interesting performance-wise um, and should be profiled, sh perhaps shouldn't really be profiled all the time. We can perhaps uh, scale down with the instrumentation and gather just some subset of the total data. Um, so we'll save up on the overhead while still perhaps obtaining enough data to be relatively precise uh, with our modeling. So let's trade a little bit of precision for, again, some uh, saving on uh, the overhead. Uh, so how do we actually do that? So we propose to optimize the profiling process on four different um, or using four different approaches. Uh, we call them recency, code structure, expected performance, and refining profiling process. Maybe just a small disclaimer. Uh, most of those approaches are not necessarily novel. Uh, in some way or shape, they have been already used in quite a lot of tools, but um, they haven't really been perhaps used in the same sense that we use them or that we intend to use them. So the general ideas were there, but we took it a bit further. And you'll see at the end of this section that we uh, again mm, came up with a new novel key idea that has the potential to achieve much more efficient profiling uh, in the end using those techniques all together. So the recency approach means that we will identify functions that have changed since the last profiling, and we will profile those functions. Since there definitely happened some uh, change, the performance might or might not have changed, but it's likely it has changed at least a bit. Uh, the code structure, so the key idea is that functions that are deep in the call stack tend to be called much more often than the other functions. Uh, I'll get to some numbers, some, some numbers we obtained, some, uh, some numbers that back up this claim a, a bit later. So uh, the idea is we don't really need to profile functions that are uh, below certain call graph, call graph depth. So if you're too deep in the call stack, you don't really need to um, profile those functions likely. Uh, and we can determine this uh, statically uh, or using call graph before the profiling uh, starts. The expected performance um, works by analyzing the code or past profiling to determine uh, functions uh, with certain complexities that are not really that important. That is quite similar to what I was talking about with the core concepts and the idea of not profiling constant functions if you can profile uh, functions that are higher in the, uh, in the call stack. And the dynamic version works uh, by estimating or identifying functions that behave in a constant-like manner. Uh, and the last one is refining profiling process, which is also sometimes called sampling, 
which means that we sample the data uh, we collect. So we don't really collect all the function calls, we only collect um, a small subset. So maybe let's go a bit deeper with those approaches so you understand a bit better how they work and what's uh, perhaps a bit difficult about them. So the recency technique means that we identify functions that have changed since last profiling. Uh, let's say I have some example of a core graph and I identify some functions which were changed since the last release and those functions should reasonably be profiled to see if something changed or not. And the key challenge is how should we define and then subsequently detect changed functions with respect to performance metrics. So this is the hard part. Uh, what is changed function uh, in terms of performance and how do we detect it? So as of now, uh, we decided to go a bit easier on the performance side thing. So we just detect uh, changed functions based on some call graph, control flow graph and source code uh, analysis. So this is our response to this challenge. We just use a bit more um, easier approach, which has some known state of the art um, algorithms and so on. Okay, so what about the call graph uh, code structure? So our call graph observation is that the number of calls of a function from a given call site often grows with the length that the call stack has upon reaching the call site. In layman layman's terms, it means that the, the deeper you are in the call stack, the higher the chance this particular function will be called much more often because usually functions uh, higher up the call stack will have some cycles in them. There will be some loops, there will be some recursion perhaps, which will result in your, let's say, small constant complexity function being called quite more often. Uh, imagine some parsing, uh, that uses a uh, function that uh, parses the next token. This function will likely be very deep in the call stack and will be called repeatedly many, many times. Uh, we actually did some experiments to see if our observation has some um, merit to it. And we found out using two uh, projects that it seems so. It, it, it truly is this case for uh, majority of functions that are deep in the call stack. So uh, if we identify uh, some call grep death, uh, we might decide to not profile functions below that particular death. Uh, so what is the challenge here? Uh, how to define the call graph depth with respect to the call graph observation? So what is actually call graph depth? Um, that's not really some uh, precisely defined term, at least not for this kind of optimizations. So we decided to go with an algorithm that computes a mm, the, the longest cyclic path uh, from the root node or from the, the let's say, perhaps um, main function to that particular function. So we obtain the worst case, uh, the, the worst case of the uh, function death, right? O of the depth in which it can occur. And based on that, we filter, uh, we, we uh, establish some thresholds below which we don't really uh, profile those functions. So it's a bit crude, um, but it, we found out that it works really good when we combine it with the other techniques. So the expected performance approach basically means that uh, we do not profile functions below certain complexity. Let's say we don't want to profile constant and linear functions. How do we determine uh, the complexity? Um, we use uh, some static analysis tools um, which perform this analysis for us. And the dynamic uh, version of expected performance is that we do not profile functions with constant-like behavior, which we detect using past profiles and results or uh, hints from our change detection, right? So those are actually the two biggest challenges, how to compute function complexity. As I said, we use some static analysis tools and how to identify constant-like behavior. We have our own, algorithm, our own algorithm based on past profiling and uh, some change detection. Okay, so the last one, sampling control. Uh, as I said, we don't really need to gather all the data for the functions we are interested in. We can record only every, let's say, nth function call. And the challenge is how to identify functions that should be sampled uh, statically, preferably, 
and how to estimate the N, which should guide uh, the sampling process. Um, so our sampling is function-based, so we don't do a global sampling thing that all functions will gather only every uh, fifth call. Uh, the sampling value is actually adjusted for each specific function, and it's adjusted in an iterative manner, again, using some past profiles uh, and uh, detected changes. And perhaps if you're profiling um, repeatedly uh, to obtain more precise results, uh, you can uh, refine this sampling value uh, across those um, iterations. So this is our response to this challenge. And as I promised, the key idea, uh, the, the key novel idea that we came up with is to combine those approaches into uh, something we call optimization pipelines. So we can decide to disable or enable each technique and we can parameterize them. So we can uh, we have a set of parameters for each of those approaches or each of those techniques uh, that basically guide the optimization strength of those particular techniques. So just a quick uh, showcase. Uh, first, we find out which functions change. Those functions should be profiled. Then we detect which functions are too deep in the call stack or in the call graph, and we decide not to profile them since we'll obtain a bit more cruder, but uh, less overhead, uh, so, so we'll, we'll cut on the precision, but achieve uh, lower overhead. And then we, we see which functions uh, are either uh, below our selected complexity level or uh, which are behaving uh, constantly in the given workloads. Uh, then for some of the functions, we apply sampling, and this is what we obtain, a set of functions that should perhaps be profiled. And for those that should, if they should be sampled or not. So this is the key takeaway. This is our uh, our idea how to achieve uh, efficient profiling. So uh, if you think about it, this is exactly what I was talking about, um, uh, achieving high granularity where it matters. So it definitely matters in functions that have changed since the last version. And it perhaps also uh, matters in some other functions that will help us get insight into some parts of code uh, that that haven't really changed. Just to see if perhaps some change in our uh, environment, in our testing beds, in our testing machines uh, caused some performance issue, right? Despite the code not changing at all. So uh, just briefly, I'll just check the time to see uh, Okay, we still have some time. So quickly, uh, we did some experimental evaluation. Uh, we focused on two case studies and there are some more uh, coming up. So we wanted to see how significant is the impact of the individual optimizations in the profiling process. And we wanted to see how significant is the impact of the optimization pipelines for different degrees of strength on the profiling process. So we chose some thresholds, uh, some uh, thresholds that um, basically define what sh what the parameters for those different optimizations should be uh, and we uh, ordered them according to their strength or the expected uh, savings uh, in terms of overhead. Uh, we did those studies on five projects total, varying sizes, varying versions. Uh, we repeated the experiments for the projects that allowed it based on their overhead. Some, we, for example, CPython, uh, was really expensive given the input of workloads we were using. Um, there were quite a lot of the inputs or the workloads, so we decided to go with uh, less uh, repeated uh, experiments. And the results we obtained, I'll show just a small set or so small subset of the results. This is for the Python. Well, we used two versions, Python 3, Python 2. Uh, arguably, Python 2 doesn't really... Um, isn't really that interesting right now, but it was interesting for the comparison. Um, and we can see that uh, for varying strengths of the optimizations, we can save on a lot of time and a lot of data collecting uh, some performance um, models or, or metrics. Uh, the key challenge here was to uh, somehow quantify the precision loss. So when you optimize profiling, you'll save. Uh, when you optimize profiling, you'll save up on the time. You'll save up on the profile size. Uh, but how does that affect the precision? 
uh, we haven't really seen any, as, as let's say this whole efficient profiling thing um, doesn't really have much more previous work uh, in this same sense. We haven't really been able to see um, or find some interesting precision metrics that we could use. So we had to uh, come up with our own. So just very briefly, the precision metrics were based on something we call hotspots. So we wanted to see if uh, after the optimization of the profiling, we were still able to identify some uh, hotspots in the uh, code base, right? If you have prof performance intensive functions, will we be able to uh, def or, or identify them as performance intensive, even if we profile um, efficiently? And we found out that in most cases, we are able to find them. And if not, um, we are able to at least detect that uh, their uh, immediate caller is intensive. So, uh, so the results were quite encouraging, I would say. Okay, uh, right now, I perhaps, uh, I think we, sh we could maybe uh, make uh, or do another uh, quick session of questions, if, if that's okay with Victor, what do you think? Um, yes, sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, so at this moment, we have just one uh, in the chat, so feel free to add more. Uh, the one is related to the um, to one of the um, improvements that you implemented uh, with this uh, call graph observation uh, mm -hmm. thing. And the question is, what uh, were the projects against which you evaluated the hypothesis that it's sufficient to uh, only profile um, functions about some some uh, calls like level. Okay, so if you can expand on that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, if I understood correctly, the question was about the observation regarding to call graph depth, and that we don't really need to profile functions that are deep within the call stack. So, we tested that on C Python, and we tested that on the entire suite of their performance benchmarks. So we run all of the benchmarks and we evaluated if that uh, condition holds for functions that are deep in the call, uh, call stack or call graph, uh, if they're called much more often than the rest. And uh, I think it was around 90% true. So for 90% of those functions, uh, we saw that they are called more often than their immediate predecessor or, or their caller. Uh, we also tested that on a... Mm, implementation of an open uh, open 122 uh, software, which is basically uh, an encoding and decoding uh, tool for um, imagery that is sent from uh, satellites. So there has been an, an application that is uh, basically sending uh, some encoded uh, images from satellites, and we had uh, access to one of the implementation of this tool and we tested uh, on that as well. And I think the results were uh, around 87%. Uh, so for 87% of function it holds, functions, it holds that they are called uh, more often than their immediate caller against uh, for some uh, set of inputs. If, if that answers the question. Hopefully it does. Thank you. Um, so the next question is uh, by Michael. If uh, if there is a specific function that wasn't profiled, but the programmer wants to profile it, is it possible to set it in your tool? Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, so apart from this whole automated process, uh, you have the option to select functions, which uh, you are absolutely positive you want to profile. And, and uh, the functions you flag as such uh, will have priority. So even if all of our uh, optimization, automated optimization techniques uh, say that this function is not worth profiling and still you say it is, uh, it will be profiled. So it's possible to modify uh, it for your specific use cases, which uh, those particular uh, techniques might not work on. Um, just a, a quick note, those techniques are, of course, heuristics. So they're not guaranteed to work every time. And that's why we still uh, allow the user to, the user input to, to make the, those techniques a bit more precise for their particular use case if, if they're not behaving correctly. OK, there's one more question. Um about the static analysis tools mm -hmm. uh, you use to estimate function complexity. Okay. Uh, so the question is what are those tools? Okay. 
Uh, as of right now, uh, we are using two different tools. Uh, one of those is uh, called Lupus, which is um, a quite interesting tool from uh, uh, one of our colleagues in, in uh, Technical University of Vienna. Uh, I, I believe the tool is a result of his dissertation uh, and the tool uh, is able to compute um, uh, the, um, uh, how, how do you call it? Um, basically resource bounds uh, for execution cost. So, uh, and, um, so this is one of those tools. And the second one is uh, the meta infer cost plugin, which is again, uh, doing some resource bound analysis. So uh, we are still open to uh, many more tools that do this analysis. We are actually planning to integrate one more in the near future, hopefully, which is a variation on the Lupus tools uh, that support uh, interprocedural analysis or intraprocedural analysis and interprocedural analysis, both of those. So uh, we will be soon integrating a third tool. So hopefully that, that answers it. Um, resource aware MO, I'm not really familiar with that one, but it might be worth uh, checking into it. So thank you for the tip. I'll definitely look into it if that would perhaps uh, help us in some way. Okay, um, so that's it for the questions. Oh yeah, there's a question, one more mm -hmm. from Conrad uh, about the plans to package per Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting question. Uh, thank you for that one. Uh, there are uh, actually, uh, to be fair, one of our bachelor students that is uh, working on uh, an extension to Perun. Uh, I'll get to that in our uh, ongoing and future work. Uh, as part of his bachelor thesis, although it wasn't required, it wasn't in the uh, in the in the bachelor thesis um, requirements. He decided to create a package. Uh, as of right now, I don't think it's yet published, but he created the infrastructure and the, the scripts to uh, to package it. So hopefully we'll be able to do so soon. Okay, so maybe this is a good time to move on to this last part. Okay. Um, just a kind of reminder, we have some uh, 18, 18 minutes. minutes until the end. So if we leave at least 10 minutes for... Mm -hmm. Uh, a discussion that would be awesome. So definitely, yeah. definitely, this so. Uh, part will be quite fast. But thank you for the reminder. Uh, so I've described the core of our approach to efficient profiling, and now let's see what are our plans for the future. Um, so the most important thing for us is to finish the experimental evaluation. We plan to uh, add some more research questions. More, most notably, we want to see if those optimization techniques are really helpful in practice, that is uh, finding real performance bugs. If we are able to find performance bugs even with our optimizations on, if so, that would be a strong claim for our techniques. They can actually be uh, put in, in practice. Um, as for the different techniques, for recency, we want to uh, tailor our algorithms that work uh, on the core graphs and control flow graphs uh, specifically for evolving software. So there's a lot of algorithms that deal with uh, control flow graph and core graph similarity and comparisons, which is the core of the, uh, the, the change detection algorithms. But they're mostly used for malware detection, malware um, identification, and so on. And we want to um, use those algorithms for evolving software. There has been some previous work, but we want to uh, work on that a bit more. And then again, uh, performance of our detection of code changes, which is something much more difficult uh, and would perhaps warrant a, a whole new uh, dissertation topic. Uh, for the code structure, we want a bit finer pruning algorithm. As I said, the algorithm as of now is quite crude. Uh, it, works, it works well when combined with others, but not so much uh, as a standalone. Uh, as for the expected performance, uh, we want to uh, utilize more state-of-the-art static analyzers. As I said, we are using Lupus and meta infer cost right now, but we'll be integrating one more soon. Uh, for the sampling techniques, we want a better sampling rate estimations and um, the, uh, the, adjust, the adjusting algorithms to work a bit more, a bit better. And perhaps we would also like to investigate 
uh, time-based sampling, which is something we actually tried with eBPF, which supports dynamic probe insertion and, um, and uh, removal. But it uh, resulted in quite a lot of overhead, at least for our use case. So we'll be exploring another uh, avenues. As for the optimization pipelines, uh, we would like to have a bit more precise strength estimation and prediction so that when you say, I want to optimize 25% of time, uh, the tool will be able to give you the precise parameters that you should use to obtain such optimization. Uh, other possible improvements or ongoing works is to improve granularity. Uh, so when I was talking about finding the root cause of issues, we are currently able to identify the function which is causing the most trouble. Uh, of course, if we would be able to identify or flag the precise basic blocks that cause the issue, that would help a lot more, right? You'll see exactly this uh, body of this condition uh, basically is uh, behaving 100% times uh, slower. So that would instantly tell you uh, what is the issue. Uh, of course, the downside is this is much more uh, overhead intensive. So that's why the efficient uh, efficiency techniques make sense here. You, you will really target precisely the code blocks, the basic blocks that are most likely to contain some change. Uh, so, so you will improve your granularity in some specific places while measuring um, on really high level in some other code space, uh, code places. And of course, finding appropriate visual visualizations uh, to help you interpret the results. I'm including a one uh, example. We were experimenting with uh, some sunburst graphs uh, where you can see that the function swap uh, in some particular code base uh, is, uh, has the most um, or is the most performance intensive and which basic block right there's only one of those so doesn't really help you that much but still uh, next we're focusing on precision that means um, when collecting data about functions and or basic blocks we can also include some information about the uh, specific parameter values that were supplied to the function so you can see if perhaps um, uh, or you can even obtain more precise models because you will be able to uh, to match the uh, the time the, the execution time to the particular parameter values and see uh, how those values um, basically uh, cause your function to behave performance wise. So this has the potential to improve our mo modeling precision quite a lot. Um, as for some more technical uh, stuff that we're working on, so we're planning to uh, support more languages. As I was saying, well, currently we're focused mainly on C, C++. C Sharp uh, profiling is currently um, in some pretty good stage uh, and Java support is, has, is in some prototype state, I would say. And next, we would like to focus on Python and Rust and so on. So we're definitely wanting to uh, increase our portfolio of programs we're able to analyze. We would also like to include more performance metrics. Mainly, we are currently focused on time consumption. Well, we have some prototypes for memory and most notably for C Sharp. And a uh, quite interesting result is a energy, um, electrical energy consumption, which was done by one of our bachelor students uh, who will be defending his thesis uh, in a month or so. Uh, and next, we would like to uh, profile some more interesting metrics such as cache hit misses, uh, some scheduler context switching and so on. I'm including uh, just some interesting imagery uh, of the energy consumption experiments or, or energy consumption profiling um, so if you're interested in more interested in more details, you can look at the, the thesis. Uh, so to conclude, uh, I was briefly talking about Perun, which is a tool we use to uh, implement our ideas our, and uh, conduct some experiments to see if our ideas are sound or not. Um, it's not just a mere profiling tool. It's much more than that. Hopefully, uh, I've been able to convince you of that. Uh, we believe that profiling efficiency can be significantly improved um, using some heuristics um, and combining them together. Um, we've obtained some encouraging results. Hopefully, uh, we'll be able to obtain uh, many more. And uh, in our ongoing and future work, 
we'll be improving our efficiency, granularity, and precision. Uh, we'll add support for more languages, metrics, and we will integrate more existing tools, not only static analysis tools, but we would like to also include more profiling tools, um, benchmarking tools, and so on. Uh, just a brief acknowledgement uh, to all the people that uh, helped us shape this tool and our ideas um, along the years we were working on this uh, with uh, the rest of the people that are developing Perun. And also, I would like to thank uh, Red Hat for sponsoring this research and uh, some Czech Science Foundation projects and uh, some PhD talent scholarship program as well. So uh, that's everything for me. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, let's hear some more interesting questions now. Thank you. Thank you for the great presentation. Um, so we have 10 minutes. Feel free to add questions to the chat or even jump in and ask them live. Uh, that will be great. Uh, so one uh, maybe uh, comment. There has been several comments by people uh, who offered uh, some possible ways of cooperation or are interested mm -hmm. in this. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm keeping these in, in separate notes and I will forward them to you after the talk so you can reach out to the people so you don't have to go through the entire chat. Okay, um, that's really great. So Thank have, you for that. Yeah, we have uh, several questions. Uh, the first one is by Dmitry and uh, the question is, uh, you mentioned several times that you've tried uh, eBPF, uh, but it has introduced uh, overhead. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you explain why that happens? Because um, is not for being very fast with low, low mm -hmm. so. Yes, yes, definitely. I agree. Uh, so uh, we haven't really been spending that much time on, on analyzing the issue as we were preoccupied with, um, with the efficiency techniques and so on. So BPF was uh let's say a quick experiment to see how well uh it it, it ha or it can support profiling compared to let's say system tap or llvm and so on uh so i have two theories why that might be uh one of those is that we were trying ebpf quite early in uh let's say it's um it, when the change happened, right? So it used to be a packet filter, then it became extended and it supported much more. So we hopped into that technology quite uh, quite recently when that switch happened. So uh, my theory is perhaps at that particular time, uh, it the, the user space probing mechanisms weren't really that um, ef efficient as they're perhaps now. So uh, one of, uh, let's say, our if future work, possible future work is to uh, again look into BPF and see if things have improved and perhaps also trying different front ends um, or different uh, libraries that work on top of BPF. So this is one possible reason that I can see. And the second is, uh, as Dimitri correctly said, uh, we're basically profiling user space programs. So perhaps that communication between user space and kernel uh, is causing a bit more overhead. Uh, to be fair, I'm not an expert in BPF uh, as perhaps Victor. So uh, maybe Victor would be able to clarify a bit more on how precisely that communication works. And if there are some possible issues uh, that might cause such overhead. So, those are the two theories we have, and we would like to uh, explore uh, BPF again uh, into more depth and see um, if the uh, situation has changed since we were trying it like three uh, or four years ago. Okay, I guess that uh, answers the question partially and uh, hopefully we'll do more. Uh, successful with your with your next attempt um there's one more question at, uh, at the point uh and the question is what is the meaning of the name perun okay uh, <laughs> that's um quite interesting question thank you for that so um if i remember correctly as uh, to be to be fair i'm not the uh the creator of perun i basically hopped in when it was uh, starting so uh 
the tool was created by my supervisor at that time, and he came up with that name. But if I remember correctly, uh, it's supposed to mean uh, performance under control. So we basically took some uh, some letters out of this uh, sentence, and it formed uh, the name Prune. So uh, that's how it happened, if I recall correctly. But there is no specific meaning behind that other than the performance under control sentence. Thanks. Uh, okay. Uh, good point by Matej. <laughs> yes, um, we know that. And since my supervisor was uh, quite a fan of uh, Slavic folklore and so on, uh, I think this was also the reason he came up with the sentence performance under control and the selected letters uh, in the first place. But um, might be the um, underlying cause or it might not. <laughs> Okay, um, we still have uh, five minutes, so we still have time for a couple of questions. No more questions in the chat at this point. I have one mm -hmm. which I would like to ask. Um, so a very common issue in performance monitoring, testing, whatever, is uh, that you might be affected by the noise from the environment. Um, so my question is, uh, if, if you observe this kind of problem in Perun, and how do you approach it? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good question. Uh, so as far as I know, the, the best possible option uh, to deal with this problem, this particular problem is to, uh, repeat the analysis. So uh, that's something you'll usually find in, in many, uh, guidelines for any type of performance analysis other than and static analysis. Uh, so, so for any type of dynamic performance analysis, you'll usually, uh, see uh, the hint to repeat the analysis, um, let's say four or five times to obtain some stable results. So for example, benchmarking, as far as I know, um, they use some specific algorithms to, um, to detect if the system is stable, if, if it's behaving, uh, somewhat stable in terms of performance so that you obtain quite precise results. Uh, so this is how we handle that too in Peru. So you can basically repeat the profiling um, many more times with the added benefit that uh, given the efficiency techniques I was talking about, uh, some of them are designed specifically for the repeated profiling use case where they will uh, give you much more efficiency when you profile the same input uh, many more times. So you'll be able to uh, profile efficiently uh, or more efficiently each time. Uh, so this is how we handle it. And um, of course, again, if you if you integrate some benchmarking tool, uh, some of those usually have those options to repeat the benchmarking uh, themselves. So you're not only uh, dependent on how Perun solves those things, but also how the tools you are using and perhaps integrating into Perun, how those tools are uh, solving this issue. And there is a follow-up by Dmitry. Um, what if the analyzed code is bimodal? Then it will not converge when you repeat the, the runs. Um, um, okay, yes. Yeah, uh, uh, that's something we haven't really addressed as far as I know right now. So um, in, in that case, um, mm, I'm not really aware of any techniques we uh, we are in, or I'm not aware of any techniques we we are employing for this particular case. So this is definitely one of the areas where we could uh, improve a bit. As I said, uh, or maybe maybe to clarify a bit more, our um, profiling tools or the, the the tracing tools and profiling tools within Peru aren't or are not something I would really call state of the call state of the art. So they're more uh, on the experimental side. Uh, so that we can integrate more uh, features and more ideas. So that's perhaps why we haven't really focused on some of the more uh, technical stuff uh, regarding precise results, right? So if we were um, employing more advanced tools, we could perhaps solve those issues a, a bit better. So this is possible avenue for, for uh, future work. Okay, thank you. Um, also, we have a comment by one of, I think it's one of the students who has, who has joined uh, about who is um, adding one more tip on how to avoid this. But we are on 
uh, one minute left uh, of the talk so, or, or of the session. So thank you again for the awesome presentation. Thanks everyone for joining, for having the questions, for the discussion. Uh, thank you, you very have, much for having me. It was if a have pleasure. Any more, if you have any more questions, feel free to reach out to Yuri directly. You can see his email on the slide. Uh, feel free to reach out to me or to Mate. We will we will forward you. Uh, and yeah, I think that's it. Thanks everyone. Thanks again, Yuri, for joining us. And hopefully, yeah, good luck with your project, with extending it. And hopefully, we will even find some cooperation with with some red hatters. Okay. Thank you again for having me. Uh, it was a pleasure. Have a nice day, everyone.